uh, nominally about July, uh, the days following July 4th in 1947. His birthday is March 31st of 1948, and that makes it a cute quip because every audience has always seemed to enjoy that kind of a crack. And obviously, I'm not being serious uh, uh, that there's a linkage, really. But um, in any case, there is one reason I want to dwell on this a little bit because for 50 years, people have conjectured what really happened there, and the Air Force has contrived one thin cover story after another over the years, each one sillier than the first, each one easily refuted by anyone that does a little homework. So you wonder, why is this thing still classified? Several presidents and uh, half a dozen congressmen have tried to crack the security surrounding Roswell to no avail. What could have happened there? that is still to this day regarded as an item of national security. And uh, now, f interestingly enough, just in the last uh, few months, there appears that we now have what some people would call the smoking gun. There is some tangible evidence that's finally emerged that there was a crash of some kind, and it did have victims of some sort. You see, when General Ramey at Fort Worth issued that cover story, there were, the press was present. And many pictures were taken. And James Bond Johnson of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram was among them. And on July 8th, he took a photograph, which a number of the photographs happened to show General Ramey clutching a sheaf of papers in his hand that apparently was a communique to Washington, D.C. And he happened to have that in his hand while he was going through this explanation and, and demonstrating that this really was a weather balloon. They had some props there that they showed and so forth. Well, it turns out that was in July 47. Since 1947, we've made a lot of progress in digital imaging technology. And this sheaf of paper that was uh, uh, photographed was analyzed with a, dig uh, a, a digital photo scanner and enlarged and, and enhanced the words printed on the folded piece of paper. And then using a program for digital enhancement and analysis, it's now been reported on Associated Press on November 22nd of the year 2002, uh, that uh, David Rudiak was able to identify several key phrases on that sheaf of paper that General Ramey was clutching during that press conference. There's a phrase, the victims of the wreck, and also the phrase, in the disk they will ship. Lots of other words that were uh, hard, to, you know, more conjectural is what they said, but the point is here's a communication in his hand going to Washington that speaks of victims of the wreck and speaks of a disc that they're going to ship while he's covering the story that, that, that uh, Colonel uh, you know, Blanchard was all mixed up. This is just a weather balloon. So finally, the, the UFO researchers have something tangible to go on because up till now, it's been a spooky thing. Let's shift a little bit from 47 to July 19th through the 26th, about a week, in 1952. I happen to remember this vividly because in June 30th of 1952, I was entering the United States Naval Academy, so I was a plebe. Uh, or I should say, yeah, a plebe at, um, uh, at Annapolis uh, when this was in the papers and much talked about at the time. It turns out a number of UFOs harassed Washington National Airport, which in those days was the only airport there. We didn't have Dulles. This is before Dulles. And uh, also Andrews Air Force Base. So badly they had to shut down the air traffic. And this went on and off and on for a week. And it was in the papers because every time the Air Force would alert jets to investigate what these things were, they would disappear. As soon as the jets landed, they came back. And uh, uh, fiery objects overrun jets over Capitol in the Washington Post. These are headlines from that period. Now, one of the things there again, they never really explained it. They issued some cover stories, but the truth of the matter is they didn't know what it was, and it wasn't just an incident one night. It went off and on for a better part of a week. Again, a mis it created a problem just in blocking all the phone traffic because everybody's calling what's going on and so forth. And, and so something real was happening. Because you're talking here multiple radars. This isn't some you know, impressionable, uh, unprofessional observer. This was uh, the Air Force Air Controllers at the Washington National and Andrews Air Force Base. And uh, never explained, at least not to the public. 1993, there, you know, by the way, there are thousands of these things to select from. I've just picked a few that seem representative. Yeah, over in Mexico City in 1993, the population by the thousands were uh, upset and disturbed by what went on. 
uh, Seoul, South Korea, November 23rd of 1996, CNN and Reuters reported a huge cigar-shaped UFO that was televised for 10 minutes on national television. You know, when we talk about witnesses, there's all kinds of people, many very reliable professionals that have contributed to this background, but the ones that you and I would tend to presume would be the most reputable, most trained, and most uh, competent in this area would be our astronauts. You think they know something about it. Do you realize that 13 of them have gone on record uh, of seeing UFOs while they were doing their missions? Uh, Ed Mitchell, Apollo 14, April 1996, and it was, this was on uh, Dateline NBC. He said, NASA <clears throat> is covering up what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico. See, this isn't just the presumption of some journalists or the, or the tabloids at the check, you know, checkout stands in the market. These, <laughs> these are serious people saying that something is being covered up. Astronaut Gordon Cooper has made many talks. On May 15th of 1963, he did the 22-orbit Mercury capsule. He saw a green UFO, which was also at the same time he saw it tracked by, our, uh, by the radar in Australia. It corroborated this. And he's testified before the United Nations that UFOs are visiting this planet. And uh, in May 1996, he said, we are being visited by aliens. So he's, settled, he's spoken a lot about this, so much so that some people tend to write him off. James Lovell, Frank Borman, <coughs> Borman excuse me. Gemini 7, December 1965. On the second orbit of their two-week flight, they saw a UFO. Gemini Control presumed it was the stage of their own Titan booster. But they indicated that they had both the booster and the UFO in sight, so that doesn't quite jive. Walter Schirra, these are all familiar names to most of us. Mercury 8, 1968. He was the first guy to use the term Santa Claus to indicate UFOs are near the space capsule. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, was about December, so everybody thought that this was just a cute quip, but it was a code word. And this was, it was later uh, in 1979, Maurice Chatelain, the chief of NASA communications, confirmed that the Santa Claus phrase was a prearranged code word to deal with the UFOs without alarming the public. And uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, these familiar names to you? Are these guys competent? On Apollo 11, July 21st, 1969, both apparently saw lights in and on a crater and there, there are unconfirmed reports that there were other spacecraft there. Some of this is classified, gets classified quickly, so we're, tra we're treading on dangerous ground. But they have said two large objects were watching them. And Armstrong is quoted in some reports of a CIA cover-up. Now those reports get uh, squelched, of course, so you, it's hard to separate what was just you know, urban legend and what really happened. But if you go to Ed White, James McDivitt, James Lovell, Borman, Shira, Gordon Cooper, these guys are all, have all reported UFOs. Neil Armstrong, Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11, Ned Mitchell, Apollo 14, and on it goes. And uh, one of the most interesting ones is John Blaha. He was a veteran of five space shuttle missions. He also was a relatively recent resident of the Russian Mir space station this a few years ago. Uh, March 24th of 1989, an amateur radio operator picked up an excer uh, a, a intercept uh, by, uh, said, Houston, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft under observation. And uh, very impressive to listen to that soundtrack and hear if the familiar voice uh, say these rather strange things. So UFOs, we could go on and on. The main point I'm trying to do at this point is just indicate there are some people that you would consider competent and reliable in multiple names that are reporting these things are real. And I would not attribute all of these to hallucinations or being impressionable or what have you. In fact, if you start looking into this area as an area of research, you'll find it extremely difficult because there are 6,000 professional publications in English alone that deal with this. There are 2,200 foreign publications, 1,350 UFO-related periodicals. And some of these, if you look at the books in the library, there are over 700 books that deal with UFOs just in the period from the 17th century to the First World War. Excuse me, the Second World War, from 1650 to 1945. There are over 300 books prior to the 17th century that deal with UFOs in the ancient times. So what on earth uh, is this all about? 